Hello to everyone. We will be starting. My name is Ladislav Faraponov. I'm a global community lead with Rubrica. Rubrica is a Ukrainian media outlet that is focusing on solution journalism approach. On behalf of Rubrica, let me say it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you tonight. And, and before we start, let me say that today's discussion uh, will be also published as a podcast on our social media. Uh, we are at almost uh, every major platform uh, speaking about podcasts. So subscribe and follow us there. We are the driver of solution journalism approach in Ukraine and in Eastern Europe. And as always, we dedicate these events uh, to the armed forces of Ukraine uh, and appreciate their brave service and sacrifice to the country because we are here thanks to them. And uh, I would just like to mention that we have received uh, some questions in advance, uh, but let me also encourage those uh, listening to us online to prepare your questions and ask them at the Q&A session. So it's been more than two years after Russia started the full-scale war. However, there are visible changes uh, in European security ar architecture. Just two days ago, when we are making this uh, episode, uh, Sweden uh, joined NATO, uh, actually following Finland. So uh, two years ago, NATO created four battle groups, uh, additional battle groups uh, in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania and Poland. Uh, and, uh, of course, we will be talking about security and uh, Ukraine's place in European security. But also, as we have uh, our uh, distinguished speakers from uh, several European countries who have helped Ukraine so much, we will be also asking them about this process and uh, and why their countries are uh, doing so much for Ukraine and also what the war means to them. So... Let me say it's a great pleasure to welcome our distinguished speakers tonight. So today with us are uh, Kai Makus, who is a former Estonian ambassador to Ukraine, and currently he's serving as Estonian ambassador to Lithuania. Good evening. Uh, today we also have uh, with us Marina Smagina, who is our colleague at Rubrica, uh, who is a senior editor at Rubrica, and uh, she is also a, a PhD candidate at University of Helsinki. Marina. Good evening. Hi. And uh, my great pleasure also to welcome Iman Slegis, uh, former L Latvian ambassador to France and, and former L Latvian defense minister. Ambassador, it's a great pleasure to, to welcome you online. So Thank let you. me... Thank you. Thank you. Let me start with uh, Ambassador Kusk, uh, because um, According to the Kiel Institute uh, for the World Economy, Estonia has notably supported Ukraine, contributing actually the, the most um, uh, in comparison to other European and uh, um, other countries, contributing 3.5 of its GDP to aid uh, for Ukraine. Can you tell us, like, what motivated Estonia's uh, substantial aid to Ukraine and uh, uh, of course we are aware that Estonia has assisted Ukraine uh, so much e also before the full-scale invasion it it's impossible to say that uh, it's only the tendency for two years but uh, still uh, it is really interesting to know like uh, basically what are the key drivers of that support in the past and how these drivers maybe have changed uh, through time, in particular through this uh, difficult, challenging two years. Thank you very much. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, Ukraine has been Estonian foreign and security policy priority. So even before the full-scale war, we were very proud that uh, we gave Ukraine humanitarian and development aid and it was the biggest part what we we uh, uh, used actually went for Ukraine and we we were absolutely happy and proud that uh, per year it was 1 million euro for humanitarian aid 1 million euro for a development aid and nowadays we are talking absolutely different uh, about different scale why we Invested, I call it investment actually. Uh, why we invested it uh, also before the 
large scale war because we Estonia we need Ukraine in this region where we are as a democratic uh, country which uh, respects the uh, rule of uh, law and uh, cooperates with us we 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 really need such a Ukraine and uh, well uh, when the large scale war started uh, Estonians not personally know the feeling, but through, uh, through parents, grandparents, we just celebrated uh, 106 years of Estonian independence, the Independence Day, 24th of February. We share this date now with you, Ukrainians. Uh, when we declared independence uh, this 106 years ago, after that came the war with the same Russian Empire, maybe just labeled a bit differently, it was Soviet Union then, but doesn't matter. The same evil Russian Empire, which is fighting the war at the moment with you. So uh, we won then, but we didn't uh, won this fight alone. We were helped by the British Navy, uh, Danish, Swedish, Finnish uh, volunteers, Latvia helped us. Uh, also, Ukraine, which fought, fought those days, but in your own corner with Soviet Union, that also helped us. So, uh, we are not leaving you, because uh, we know what uh, Russia did. Already four years uh, later, then 1924, they tried to attack us again with uh, so-called green men. They didn't call them green men uh, those days, but... Uh, they, they wanted to overturn our government and uh, we were able to fight back. So uh, that's historical memory. We have been under occupation. We know what uh, suffering uh, means under occupation. Russian peace uh, actually means uh, suffering. And uh, of course, uh, this current war, it's not only about Ukraine. It's about us as well, because Russia gave demands. December 2021 uh, for Europe, basically asking to leave the Eastern Europe uh, to their hands. No, we can't, uh, we can't accept it. So result of this current large scale war affects us uh, all. And we Estonians, we can accept only win. So that means we have to invest into uh, into you. Uh, that's uh, that's why we we try to be uh, innovative. Also, actually, if uh, if we're talking about resources or or weapons. Okay, and uh, we will continue this uh, subtopic. I would say um, in a bit. Uh, let me turn to um, Ambassador uh, Ambassador Legis. Um, we hear and read also a lot about the so-called Ukraine fatigue uh, and uh, f kind of phrases uh, about domestic priorities in policy making, kind of regarding uh, providing aid to Ukraine. Uh, like uh, it, it is interesting uh, to know. Uh, what security implications uh, were relevant at the time for Latvia and uh, actually which of them are also also relevant uh, today? Because Latvia also contributed uh, and contributes a lot uh, to Ukraine. Uh, and uh, it is interesting to know what specific uh, security implications uh, are important for, for Latvia's uh, Foreign policy making. Yeah, well, um, thank you very much for the question. And once again, it's uh, a great pleasure to offer uh, by my participation today some support to Ukraine, which is uh, the question of supporting Ukraine is at the top of the foreign policy and defense policy agenda in Latvia. And this has been so, uh, especially uh, for the last two years since the full scale war began on the 24th of February. But also it was there, obviously, after 2014, because we're now marking 
10 years of Russia's uh, aggression and uh, imperialistic uh, aggression coming into the forefay uh, where, you know, the people of Ukraine are suffering and they're fighting uh, Europe's war on the front lines. And I think Latvians also feel this very much because of the history that uh, that uh, Kaimo already referred to. Uh, you know, we, we, we're very... Uh, when the 24th of uh, February events occurred, uh, many people in Latvia uh, have memories of deportations. Uh, you know, the, the big issue here in Latvia is also uh, the question of uh, how children are being deported, over 20,000 children uh, uh, to, uh, to Russia. Uh, and this is, uh, this is an appalling uh, crime against humanity. And that's why we were very happy and honoured to have uh, the uh, First Lady of Ukraine uh, addressing a conference specifically on this issue a few weeks ago in Riga. So uh, the uh, security implications are that, uh, you know, Latvia is uh, increasing its uh, defence budget to 3%. Uh, this year we were on about 2.4%. Uh, we have had a turnaround in the sense within society uh, that... Uh, uh, everybody is, is responsible because we saw the brave people of Ukraine fighting uh, on the 24th of uh, February and the days following that and stopping this uh, brutal aggression. And so this was a fantastic example uh, to not only Latvians, but I think people throughout the world, as well as the very brave and courageous uh, approach taken by your president, who has been a fantastic uh, uh, example of, how, of leadership in this time of, of existential crisis for the country. So uh, because of this, uh, uh, yes, we have now decided to devote 0.25% uh, of our defense budget also to supporting uh, Ukraine. Uh, we're doing this by obviously training uh, soldiers uh, here in Latvia. We uh, last year trained 4,000 or so. We hope to do a similar amount this year. We are leading within the uh, Ramstein coalition. We have taken on the lead uh, on the uh, on, on the uh, drone coalition, and we recognise fully that we everybody needs to look at what Ukraine's urgent needs are today, and these are ammunitions, their air defences, and they are drones. And so, because of this, these are the issues that we're focusing on. And uh, there was even a, a meeting of this uh, uh, newly established drone coalition in Riga today. Uh, we're leading this coalition in very close cooperation with guidance of Ukraine, but also with the United Kingdom leadership. And so uh, these are the type of specific efforts that I think we need to, everybody needs to get involved in to ensure that uh, Russia is stopped because if Ukraine doesn't stop Russia, then, as your president has rightly said, that will be the end of Ukraine. But it will also mean that uh, we face more substantial and uh, serious um, threats from Russia. And, uh, you know, many leaders, even over the last couple of months, have been talking about uh, Russia attacking NATO member states. So, uh, of course, we have a vested interest in, 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 in supporting you. And quite rightly, I think uh, Kaimo also referred to the fact that this is an investment. And we had a, uh, a debate, a, a live television debate with experts uh, uh, surrounding the two year anniversary uh, these last few days. And I was struck by what a, uh, an economist was asked, well, what about these expenses, the defense expenses that the country is having for um, uh, for uh, helping Ukraine. And he, as an economist, and I was really uh, pleasantly surprised by his reply, he said, these are not expenses. When we look at it from uh, expenditure and income, these are investments that we're making. So this is uh, how it's being perceived, as well as, of course, a lot of support from, uh, from civil society uh, and collections, uh, uh, sending uh, equipment, sending... Uh, food supplies and other essential items to our Ukrainian friends and uh, colleagues who are suffering in this uh, crucial time for Europe. Thank you.
Absolutely. And uh, it, I I don't think it's a it's a coincidence that basically both of you mentioned uh, about investments. Uh, and um, I think we will uh, touch upon this uh, just a bit later. And of course, to speak about Ukraine, we need to bring Ukrainians so we cannot miss the opportunity to talk publicly with uh, our colleague Marina Smahina, who lives in Finland right now. So today we will try to combine serious security talk with the people's perspective because it's the most essential part of every country i think so actually marina let me uh, turn to you how does it feel after two years of uh, living abroad and uh, uh, as we call it uh, in ukraine kind of kind of working for ukraine but still uh, being abroad Yes, <clears throat> thank you, Vlad, and hi, everyone, again. Uh, also, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, well, yeah, for context, working for Ukraine basically means promoting Ukraine, promoting support for Ukraine, supporting our economy, uh, making like a general contribution to the bigger cause for Ukraine support and visibility. And um, actually, I think that it wouldn't even necessarily involve working directly with Ukraine for many people. Uh, one might be doing something for Ukraine support even without that direct connection to Ukraine. But yeah, um, in my case, um, that's a good question and one I um, don't necessarily know how to answer um, wholly. Like, uh, yeah, the short answer would be uh, it only feels right. Um, if we dig a little deeper, though, I uh, think it might reveal us something about the Ukrainian community abroad overall, in general. Uh, for context, like Vlad said, I, alongside working at Rubrica, I'm also doing research as a PhD student in the field of sociology and migration studies. And um, there is this term, translocality. Uh, and it basically means building your life across borders and being present and arranging your life in multiple places and spaces sort of simultaneously, um, being defined with multiple locations, um, keeping your connections with your place of origin and uh, like adapting to your current place of living. And um, which is quite often the case of migration, with migration, but uh, we can witness it specifically vivid with forced migrants, I think, and all Ukrainians abroad, well, not all Ukrainians abroad, those that left Ukraine after the war started, they are forced migrants by definition. Um, yeah, I feel like this is very representative for many Ukrainians abroad these days, this sense of translocality, right, regardless of whether they still work with Ukraine or not. And basically what it means is we live in two different places. Uh, I am present physically in Finland, while so many spaces in my life are still reserved up to Ukraine, work, again, Rodrika, family ties, friends, online space, media space. We, most Ukrainians abroad, follow news from Ukraine very closely. And uh, it's a constant feeling of duality that many migrants describe as a state of being in between, like in betweenness. You're neither fully here nor there. Um, yeah, and uh, this is the way, like, I think this is one of the things that was hard to predict for Ukrainians uh, before the war started. Even those who braced themselves for the conflict, for what followed. Um, I think this is one of the things that we couldn't think about, the experiences that would follow, actually. And... Um, yeah, oh my God, I hope I didn't go too far from, from the topic of how it feels to work for Ukraine. But yeah, it feels like it, it feels like what you need to be doing. If you have, like me, if you have an opportunity to be doing that, it feels great and it feels like the right thing to do. Um, yeah, so I, I think that that covers it uh, quite fully. Absolutely. Uh, let me turn uh, back to Ambassador Kusk, uh, because um, uh, um, for many Ukrainians, Estonia, uh, especially given uh, the number of aid uh, and also, I would say, the public perception uh, is uh, kind of considered to be a role model of, um, of supporting Ukraine. But uh, unfortunately, not so many Ukrainians, and uh, I would... Uh, 
uh, doubt that uh, Europeans as well understand uh, like uh, how has the perception of Estonian foreign policy uh, shifted uh, domestically and uh, internationally after the full-scale war started and also I would like to ask um, uh, because uh, you have left Ukraine just uh, several months ago yeah like um, like it was last year and um, uh, basically could you share some specific initiatives uh, that uh, uh, you are particularly proud of uh, kind of both uh, for the time when uh, you were an ambassador and uh, in general uh, from Estonia's side yes of course uh, well uh, continuing uh, we, we are talking with Imads already about investments, uh, but first example will be, I think, connected with that. It's uh, javelins, what we gave uh, Ukraine uh, six days before the large-scale war started. I was in Borispol airport, the military part of that, and we got the first batch of uh, javelins uh, and we handed them over on the 18th of February, uh, 22. And... Uh, our uh, highest military general Herem has very well said those javelins were bought in a black scenario to shoot against Russian tanks. Well, this black scenario started against Ukraine, so we deliver those javelins to Ukraine and they will be shooting against Russian tanks. So. It's basically money spent according to the bookkeeper's rules. Uh, we have to, <coughs> we have to say. So this is definitely we 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 took those javelins before the large scale wars and they delivered. Uh, your deputy minister of defense was meeting me and 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 promised and said that they will deliver them to the battle and fighting units uh, and they are not stored somewhere in the warehouses. Uh, uh, second, uh, what is very personal to me, uh, I was in Kiev when the large scale war started, but uh, a few days later we moved with the majority of the team to Lviv. Uh, military attaché and deputy stayed in Kiev, but uh, I was with the uh, rest of the team in Lviv and we helped from there over the border uh, through the military aid. So during the first days, we helped to get into Ukraine more than 40,000 anti-tank mines. That's just one example uh, how we how we worked then basically in the first hours of the and days of the large-scale war. And uh, third one, uh, we are compact country. I'm not using the word small because, uh, well, we are a full nation, but we are compact, so our resources are limited. Uh, but what we can do, we can be first. We can break taboos. There was a moment in the first months of the large-scale war when uh, some of the Western countries said that, yeah, well, but we cannot give you Ukraine uh, weapons, so uh, our... Uh, uh, warehouses will become empty and we showed that yes we can we gave ukraine all our towed howitzers really good ones so uh, recently saw the video clip uh, where uh, your minister of defense thanked uh, us uh, for that uh, one by five uh, caliber so uh, respect in that sense and one thing which is absolutely non-military but uh, Ukraine needs every kind of uh, aid uh, for the people who are living in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, rare should be also uh, in a good shape or functioning because frontline can fight when they know that their wives and kids are okay. So we built Zhutom Roblast kindergarten, first modern kindergarten with a proper bomb shelter. First time in Estonian history, we made a project of kindergarten with a bomb shelter and we built it uh, to Rotomer Oblast. So uh, 160 kids can go to kindergarten and their parents know that they are safe. So uh, 
that's I'm really proud because it, it wasn't very obvious uh, uh, when we started this project. Someone asked that, yeah, shall we really uh, need this one uh, there? And, uh, and I said that, of course, we, we need because then the mothers can go to work and help uh, economy actually not to collapse uh, and fathers on the, on the front line. That's, uh, that's, that's the case, of course. So uh, those four things I can uh, mention, I was uh, personally involved as well. And if we now can we uh, jumping the first part of the question was how, yes uh, yes 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 absolutely how, uh, uh, actually how the public perception in terms of kind of foreign um, basically foreign policy making uh, has shifted uh, and uh, uh, if uh, yes. Uh, basically how it's uh it's visible you know and uh, uh or or you know it, it is also possible that uh, it can be visible only just to experts to uh to those involved in this uh, uh in this field but uh it, it is always interesting to know uh the public discourse of course uh, we didn't need to change dramatically actually our foreign policy in Estonia. There was no U-turn uh, in that sense because uh, for us uh, things have been clear more or less uh, from the beginning of 90s when we got our independence back. I give the example from my previous career. We Estonian, uh, we are very pragmatic and we are putting our resources only where it is really needed. So we are prioritizing uh, our task. So Estonian intelligence always have had three priorities. Yeah, three, yeah, three fingers. So it's first, it's Russia, second is Russia, and the third priority, also Russia. So <clears throat> we we didn't uh, need to explain very much. We just uh, uh, pushed the uh, throttle into the <clears throat> into the floor, so to say. Actually, uh, boosted it up. Uh, our uh, our uh, messages also very uh, black and white uh, and clear things because this war is very black and white. There's no gray things and both sides. No, there's no both sides. There's a one aggressor, the other is fighting for its freedom, and we are supporting the one who is fighting for its uh, freedom. So it's I think our foreign policy is more value based now. Uh, we have also started to look uh, more clearly what China is doing, for example. Uh, at the moment, I'm in uh, Lithuania. Lithuanians uh, let Taiwan open its representation uh, here in Vilnius. Well, we indicated uh, Taiwan as well from Tallinn that if they are interested in to open Taipei representation in Tallinn, we will look at that positively. So uh, now we will see uh, whether they, they uh, ask uh, that. Uh, and uh, well, we also understood more clearly that uh, United Nations and OSCE, for example, needs tremendous uh, reforms. And uh, I'm, I'm personally, it's now not official, but I'm personally not convinced even uh, after reforms whether those two are able to, to uh, survive and uh, have a meaning uh, in, in their jobs, actually. So uh, we are focusing, Estonia, our efforts uh, more on two organizations, let's say European Union and NATO, which have uh, fulfilled the core tasks uh, uh, for us, for, definitely. And, well, uh, we welcomed Sweden in the beginning of the session today. Well, I'm waiting, looking forward to uh, Ukraine to join uh, both uh, both clubs, uh, of course, as, as well. And, uh, yeah, I think people's in, people in Estonia community quite the same Thing. They, they look at uh, uh, what what uh, Russia is doing. Uh, when we started, I I mentioned that uh, 
everybody have re relatives who have been deported uh, to Siberia uh, or uh, relatives who fought in resistance uh, as uh, forest brothers, we called them, like that against communists. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's quite clear. Yeah, uh, and um, I would just like to add that um, uh, to your point about being being pragmatic, I would say that uh, as for me, kind of Estonia's assistant is really perceived in Ukraine as a very specific kind of very concrete and, uh, uh, you know, it's um, like it's always an, uh, an example for um, for Ukrainians, uh, basically, just to send uh, the news about Estonia's uh, assistant to to some foreign friends and say like, Look, uh, basically, here we are. Um, okay, let me turn to um, Ambassador Legis um, uh, back. And um, I understand uh, that uh, Ambassador Kus cannot tell us directly everything what we really want to know. So let me use the, the privilege to ask you uh, some tough questions, I would say. Uh, and the first one uh, being about NATO and Ukraine, because many Ukrainians and policymakers as well um i would say saddened by mm, the mm, some not so fast track i would say to extend an invitation to y ukraine uh, despite its significant military capabilities that uh, that really no one can doubt uh, so as for now in ukraine every, everyone is talking about us congress aid uh, but there will be a NATO summit pretty soon. So uh, Ukraine right now is trying to uh, to get uh, like some security cooperation agreements with uh, several key partners. But uh, we still believe that uh, that NATO is uh, the key um, and final security guarantee for Ukraine. So. From your perspective, actually, what uh, more should Ukraine do to achieve uh, uh, in this uh, in this process? I mean, to get specifics about NATO membership finally. Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Vlad. First of all, can I say that uh, um, the last few months I've actually taken on another official position in the government. I'm an advisor to the current Minister of Defence. So uh, I'll also have okay. A, a okay. certain reservations, uh, but nevertheless, perhaps I can uh, also share with you the fact that uh, I was uh, Latvia's ambassador to NATO at the time that we uh, joined the alliance I, between uh, uh, 1997 and 2004. So, uh, of course, the first thing to remember is that uh, all existing members of the alliance have to agree to a new member joining. I mean, we saw how Hungary, Turkey really messed around with uh, Sweden's accession. Sweden hasn't yet joined. You join NATO when you deposit the... Sorry? No, no, uh, join... it's okay. Yeah. yeah, you join NATO when you deposit the instrument in Washington. Uh, so all, and, and I'm not sure the, the, the Hungarian parliament voted but I understand that the president also has to uh, sign off to the, and they have a, a strange situation where the existing president resigns and they're in the process of appointing a new one. So, you know, I mean, it's virtually done, but it's not, formally it's not there. So you do need unity for all of these decisions. Uh, and uh, as we saw at the Vilnius summit uh, last year, uh, there was no unity on inviting uh, uh, Ukraine to join. Uh, I think the reservation that is out there is, of course, that uh, if Ukraine is invited at the time of a war against Russia, it means that the whole of NATO is immediately at war with Russia. And you can see that, uh, you know, there is reluctance to uh, get engaged in a direct conflict between NATO and Russia. So you rightly mentioned uh, the fact that uh, uh, this issue, which came up at the uh, in the sidelines of the Vilnius summit, uh, the G7 meeting, where there were declarations made about uh, bilateral guarantees uh, being given to um, to Ukraine, and it's important to note that uh, 
just, you know, in the lead up at the time of the second anniversary uh, last week, we had both Germany and France, the, the two most important uh, countries in, in the European Union, uh, signing these agreements. Uh, I think the United Kingdom, who are doing an incredible amount in supporting uh, Ukraine, I think that has to be recognised. They're also very much in the lead. But let's not forget that uh, Germany uh, is now the second uh, most uh, uh, important financial contributor to Ukraine uh, after the United States of America. So uh, the, these uh, issues are out there and uh, uh, what we can do, and, and I think that what was given to Ukraine at the uh, at the Vilnius summit meeting was this uh, consultation mechanism, the the NATO Ukraine Ukraine Council, which is of course has been used uh, on several occasions since then, uh, where there are direct discussions between NATO foreign ministers, uh, your president, your foreign minister, defense ministers. So these are the these are the issues and. Uh, uh, if the war is still, I think the the main most important uh, issue at the moment is is really uh, in the next uh, few months. Well, for Ukraine, it's the next days and hours, uh, minutes to supply uh, more ammunition and to supply air defence. Uh, these Taurus uh, from Germany, uh, the F-16s. We don't know whether they're there or they're not there, but uh, these are the issues that have to be focused on so that. Uh, 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 Ukraine can uh, uh, win this war that is being conducted by Russia. So I think those are, uh, and obviously for the 75th anniversary summit, I mean, we here with six other members of NATO are uh, celebrating 20 years of being in the alliance now. Uh, it's clear that uh, just as we see that the contributions and uh, NATO does demand contributions. Uh, you can't just be a consumer of security. Uh, we see that uh, Finland and and, and uh, Sweden will immediately be able to offer a real military contributions to the alliance. Uh, and it, there's no doubt that given the experience of uh, Ukraine uh, uh, fighting very bravely and courageously against Russia, that you already, uh, we're already learning from Ukraine. You know, NATO is learning from Ukraine. Uh, NATO, after 2014, a lot of NATO countries did help with uh, training uh, you, you, the Ukrainian armed forces. And I think this was very important when it turned into 2022. And also uh, in the intelligence uh, front, you know, the I think the assistance that you received and the the level now that your intelligence services have achieved are are incredibly important in this uh, war because it's not just the war on the ground, it's the uh, intelligence war, it's the hybrid war, uh, it's the cyber war, uh, it's the electronic war, which is, uh, again, we're uh, able to learn a lot from how uh, this is being conducted uh, by Russia through the activities of uh, of Ukraine. I just want to say uh, a couple of words on what Marina said, because uh, uh, I, my background is that uh, I was a Latvian born in the United Kingdom. My parents were refugees, uh, you know, when the Soviet Union occupied Latvia for the second time, uh, 1945, at the close of the war. So I was involved in the exile community. And, uh, you know, so for 50 years, uh, the uh, international, uh, most of the Western countries never recognized that Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania were legally part of the Soviet Union. And this is, of course, carried over to uh, their occupation of uh, Ukraine, of, of Crimea and the eastern parts of, uh, of, of Ukraine. And uh, clearly, uh, you know, we have, well, I certainly hope that Marina will not be out of Ukraine for uh, 50 years. <laughs> but uh, uh, and I know that many uh, refugees, when they first arrive in their uh, destiny, uh, their country of uh, destiny, or the country that receives them, imagine, just as my parents did, that they would be going back after a few years to their country. Well, that didn't happen after during the Cold War, but we regained our freedom 50 years later. So, uh, But at the moment, I think we're at a, this year is really a tipping point for 
the existence of Ukraine, to the existence of the security architecture in the whole of Europe and potentially beyond Europe. Absolutely, and um, I couldn't agree more uh, about the history of of non of kind of non recognition uh, of the occupation, especially from the United States, and uh, it was uh, the the greatest sign of uh, solidarity with uh, Latvia, uh, Estonia, and uh, in Lithuania, and uh, it was basically one of the key drivers uh, 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 after after forty years of. Um, of the Soviet occupation. So before I turn to, to Marina for the next question, let me remind everyone that we uh, will have a Q&A session so you can think of your questions right now. So uh, Marina, how does the Finnish public see uh, that change of being kind of neutral for many decades and uh, actually what is happening uh, right now? Um, well, I'm not necessarily an expert on Finland's public opinion, but I um, I would say that, like Kaimo uh, mentioned before, that for Estonia, nothing changed much in the in their perception of NATO, NATO and the uh, foreign policy. There wasn't any U-turns uh, for Finland, and I think there was. <laughs> um, and it like the public attitude and opinion changed right after Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, right after that, more than half of Finns started supporting NATO membership. And um, in particular, it became more popular because um, like even the left wing started supporting um, getting to NATO uh, and it got a lot of media coverage. So like the whole narrative changed a bit. Um, even though, uh, like, even though Finland uh, has changed its neutrality, it doesn't mean that before Finland was all like rainbows and uh, uh, unicorns. They, uh, I, I think, they fully understood like the dangers that were coming from having a border with Russia. Given again, given their history, which they share a lot of like similar similar mi milestones that we experienced with Russia in Ukraine. They also had war with Russia. They had chunk of their ter territory occupied by Russia, um, and like um, like for example, I had a conversation with uh, someone who um, did their service duty some years ago, uh, and they told me that when they had military trainings, for some reason the danger was always coming from the east. I wonder what that reason was. Um, so yeah. Um, the this history with Russia that Finland has, I think this is one of the things that drives them to support to supporting Ukraine and to being one of the, um, um I'd say loudest supporters. Uh, I mean, we've been uh, hearing Finnish officials uh, saying multiple times that the uh, support that Ukraine is getting right now is not enough and that it should be there should be more and uh, the actions should be more swift. Mm. Yeah, and um, again, someone mentioned before that uh, NATO officials and some European countries' leaders are talking now about the possibility of Russians attacking in two or three years. And this raises a question, like an inevitable one, if in three years Russia attacks other countries, what's happened to Ukraine? <laughs> Where did Russia get it, like the resources uh, for this attack? This is why... This is like, it's simple logic. This is why it's absolutely essential to support Ukraine now. Um, even like in most pragmatic terms, because the security of Europe, it really depends um, on what happens in Ukraine now. Because uh, if uh, Russia gets an upper hand in Ukraine, then it might as well uh, invade any other country, any other neighboring country. And like, for example, Finland can be next. And if, I believe that Putin even said said once that uh, once Finland um, joined NATO, that like, haha, you're next. If we if we are in conflict with NATO, Finland is gonna be next. Um, yeah, uh, so I feel like Finnish people can see this and um, even all sen sentiments aside, 
they can see that their security lies upon what happens in Ukraine. And um, that the support that we need is vast, but it, it also needs to be swift because the longer the war lasts, the um, more chances Russia gets to adapt to the current circumstances and to like grow from there. So yeah, uh, the public is all pro NATO. Uh, in, by the way, in December, they had another poll um, I think the University of Helsinki actually allowed it, and uh, the um, uh, support for NATO was over 80%, which is quite a big number for a country that's only recently uh, was neutral. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, guys, we have received some questions from our audience in advance, uh, so I cannot uh, miss the opportunity to ask those questions, but uh, after that, uh, it will be your time uh, if you have some questions to our speakers. So, uh, Ambassador Kusk, I would like to address this question to you and perhaps to, to Ambassador Legius uh, if he has uh, something to say. Um, from time to time, we uh, we have received uh, some news that uh, Russian spies have been identified in Europe. And uh, the question from our audience is, uh, what strategies are being considered or implemented to address the threat of the Russian fifth column within the EU? Well... Thank you very much. Uh, first, I'm not avoiding the question. I just wanted to comment on NATO as well because uh, I didn't have a chance. Uh, Absol absolutely, you're welcome. Of course. Very clear points. Uh, NATO is an ultimate uh, security guarantee and that's why it is very important for Ukraine to join NATO. And we, we talked uh, with that uh, during my term when we met uh, Zelensky the understanding is there. All those agreements which you are signing at the moment, and we are working with Ukraine as well, Estonia is working actually to sign also bilateral security agreement cooperation, is meant to help you win the war and become a NATO member. All those agreements should be valid until you are a NATO member. So... Uh, we are working with you on, on, on that. Uh, talking about uh, uh, people uh, who still dream about uh, being uh, under the Russian Empire, uh, I think we all have some of them. Uh, your services are doing good job and showing publicly when they arrest uh, the ones. Uh, our internal security service recently just uh, arrested 10 pers uh, persons who were instructed by Russian services to spread chaos, by the way, to attack our most prominent Russian language media platform, main uh, chief editor. Uh, editor's car and ministers, our Minister of Interior's car, actually. So, uh, quite bluntly, uh, Russians uh, are working, but uh, hey, we are answering uh, with a very robust uh, manner to these kind of attempts. We are resting. The ones who are dreaming about uh, Ruski Mir uh, spreading into Estonia, promoting it actively, spreading false information. Well, if you want to live in Ruskimir, we are sending them out. Live there. And what a surprise. When uh, our internal security service are guiding them over the border, then they are screaming. They don't want to uh, leave European Union and somehow also don't want to uh, go out uh, from the NATO umbrella. But uh, I think what, what has changed is that we, we have been uh, more tougher. Okay, we have arrested uh, spies uh, in previous years as well. We are pretty good in that. But I think we can say that there's a zero tolerance uh, at the moment to those who try to poison our society or uh, 
clearly working against us. Uh, the percentage is not very big, it's not critical percentage, but uh, you will always have uh, those kind of people in uh, even uh, far from, uh, from, from Russian border. Okay. And um, and um, and Ambassador Legis, uh, if you have uh, something to say uh, on this question, uh, okay, you're also welcome. But uh, I have a, another question uh, to you as well. And originally, the question was actually, what will Europe do if Ukraine falls? And I cannot miss the opportunity to add if the conflict is frozen, because it's not in in Ukraine's interest uh, as well. Yeah, well, um, I think uh, I don't want to go into hypothesis about a negative scenario uh, if Ukraine falls. I think we need to work and focus on Ukraine winning. Um, and I think, you know, Ukraine is now in negotiations with the European Union and also to become a member. You know, we've been focusing more on NATO, but let's not forget the important uh, European Union elements and the flags that were on Maidan Square, you know, in the lead up to uh, uh, the events of 2014 were, uh, were European Union flags and this uh, determination by the people of Ukraine to become more, you know, to join the family of democratic nations and accept the values. And uh, so, so that's crucial. And I think that uh, will have to remain there. And uh, the, uh, of course, it's in the interests of Russia that, uh, uh, the thing, the, the war drags on. That is their tactic at the moment. They want to, uh, you know, they would love to have another uh, uh, frozen conflict uh, that they can control. Uh, uh, of course, there is increasing focus on their activities in Moldova, uh, you know, and uh, if, if there is uh, uh, talk about, uh, because Moldova has also, uh, is also a candidate country for the European Union. So, these are the issues that uh, the European Union has to be uh, focusing on and increasing the uh, cooperating with, with candidate countries to integrate them into the European Union and uh, avoid uh, uh, this situation where, uh, you know, there is doubts and that, that Russia is dictating how uh, the strategy and how the security of Europe should look in the future. So, um, and I think that uh, obviously the question of greater European uh, uh, support is very much out there because of uh, uh, you know what's happening in the United States at the moment, the fact that the uh, there is chaos in the lead up to the elections in November to a certain extent, uh, uh, the decision about uh, granting the sixty billion dollars uh, to Ukraine is being held up. Uh, by Trump and a very small minority of Republicans, despite the fact that the majority of Democrats and Republicans actually support Ukraine and uh, want to do what they can. So that's the, so, you know, there, there are a lot of calls for Europe to do more. And I think that uh, as a result of that, uh, and also to mark uh, the beginning of the third year of the full-scale war, uh, President Macron, we saw this week, uh, had uh, heads of state and government in Paris to uh, discuss what concretely and what further immediate action could be uh, uh, taken by European countries uh, to uh, give uh, this uh, uh, extremely necessary support to Ukraine. I mean, on the intelligence question, uh, it's a good question, of course. Uh, I think there has been a downgrading of uh, the activities of the Russian in intelligence services with all the uh, expulsions that we saw, uh, you know, uh, over the last few years. Uh, there is evidence that they are reorganizing themselves and that uh, there will be an increasing uh, use of these hybrid tactics, uh, disinformation. Uh, as you know, Riga has this NATO center of excellence on strategic communication where you know, we're studying very closely uh, not only uh, Russia's uh, uh, disinformation uh, uh, campaigns, but also those of other countries. Uh, we've seen also that the, the French intelligence chief has recently 
draw attention to the fact that this is uh, an issue that France is looking at, Germany likewise. We see the interference in the democratic process, uh, the support uh, for um, uh, extreme parties, whether they are of the extreme left or the extreme right, Le Pen party in, in France, the, uh, uh, the extreme uh, uh, right-wing party in, uh, in Germany, and uh, uh, so, so these are, are really the issues that are out there. And I think uh, we have to be, you know, very aware and expose what they're doing. Uh, and you know, as 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 uh, uh, as uh, Kaimo said, uh, uh, Latvia is also very vigilant in uh, uh, having zero tolerance to this. Uh, and we do prosecute prosecute cases. There is uh, a higher focus and awareness of this being an important issue uh, as we move ahead. Thank you. Uh, okay, so let me turn to our audience online because um, mm, we are almost almost running out of time. So please, uh, uh, I see uh, just one question in, in the chat and uh, let me ask those uh, who are listening uh, to us online that uh, if you have something specific to ask, it is the time to do so. So let me uh, read uh, the question. Um, do you believe if Russian propaganda and uh, misinformation are countered properly uh, across EU countries? So I would say probably it's uh, okay if uh, if everyone uh, among our speakers uh, has uh, something to say, and uh, I would start from uh, um, Ambassador Legis, uh, then um, Ambassador Kusk and uh, Marina, please. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a continuation, this question is a continuation of what I was sort of uh, referring to. And I think that uh, the European Union has, uh, as an entity, has set up, uh, uh, you know, structures uh, to look at this particular issue. So it is becoming uh, aware that there is a uh, a hybrid centre also that has been established, Centre of Excellence in, in Helsinki, to deal with these issues uh, amongst other hybrid threats. So uh, I think that, uh, uh, that, that there is a lot being done. But of course, uh, there's also the question of the Trojan horse uh, or the Trojan horses, you know, where we have the, the problems of, of Orban, you know, the Prime Minister of uh, uh, of Hungary having uh, closer relations with uh, with uh, President Putin, this being exploited obviously by Putin. Uh, at the end of the day, we have seen that uh, Hungary has come on board, and that that has been the case. They've messed around, uh, and uh, they. Uh, it's important, I think, what the European Union, uh, the message that it gives to Hungary, uh, especially when we look at the last uh, issue of. Uh, of uh, this question of the uh, uh, the release of the the funding, uh, where Orban was quite clearly told that then uh, uh, Section Seven of uh, one of the European Union treaties would be would be enacted against specifically against Hungary, so that their voting rights would be excluded. So so yeah, I think the uh, you know on the one hand uh, there is the broad issue of dealing with it, uh, the attacks from Russia. And on the other hand, you know, handling the sort of Trojan horses uh, and the potential problems within the European Union itself. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, Ambassador Kusk, please. I think we are working better and better in Europe uh, and in the West as a whole. Uh, uh, we uh, promote... Uh, uh, qu quality outlets like Rubrica, for example, uh, you have managed to send uh, Marina to Helsinki. I appreciate that. Uh, well, joking, <laughs> joking a bit, but I re still remember the first interview I gave, uh, one of the first ones uh, for Anastasia and uh, Marina in uh, uh, our embassy in Kiev. Uh, Russian propaganda channels have been closed down, not everywhere i'm still i'm surprised that there are still some european union countries where you can uh, turn on the rtr or the 
Per il canal, it's uh, embarrassing actually because there's nothing to do with journalism. Uh, it's a, it's a pure influence uh, and information uh, spreading operation channels. Uh, so uh, so uh, some sometimes you 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 can't argue with lies because uh, it takes too much energy. Just uh, shut them down. And sometimes uh, we still are too polite, uh, so we need to be uh, more blunt, more uh, straightforward, uh, call uh, spade to spade uh, the, the things with the right names. If Putin is talking about uh, denazification, well, it lost. It has been lost in translation. It doesn't mean that there's some mythical Nazis in Ukraine. No, they are not. I didn't see any. Putin is talking about getting rid of Ukrainians. It's getting rid of nation. And we are translating it uh, to absolutely wrong way. So uh, so we have to be more, more straightforward. But uh, just one thing to add, uh, what uh, Ivan uh, just uh, said, uh, we need to be more positive. Uh, there have been months uh, from October, November, December, January as well, where uh, all those negativism uh, started to spread and Russia is amplifying those kind of things. Uh, that uh, the situation is worse than ever. No, I, I, I don't agree. I was a year ago there. We didn't have, we didn't have electricity, electricity in, uh, in, in Kiev, actually. We, how we washed our laundry, the diplomats, actually. So you're pushing the laundry into a laundry machine and when the electricity comes back, you're pushing the express button hoping that you can uh, wash it. Electricity is there. Ukraine can even export it a bit to European Union. Country in war can export electricity to European Union. Not bad. Of course, frontline, absolutely dif the, the, the difficult. But negative scenarios, uh, pessimistic scenarios are useful only when action are, are, is following. Otherwise, they will freeze you. You 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 get uh, very very bad mood, and you think that oh everything is gone. No, oh, what should I uh, even do anymore? No no no. You, we we can't let uh, these kind of uh, things uh, happen and and spread. So uh, more positivity. We will uh, we will win. Absolutely. And uh, I would just like to say that uh, these events are designed especially to change the perception towards uh, more, more positivism as well. And uh, it's exactly the, the reason why we are doing them. So absolutely. Uh, Marina, uh, probably, probably you have something to say on the previous question. And I think we have just one question uh, about Estonian intelligence. So... I believe it will go to Ambassador Kusk as well. So, uh, basic Marina, do, do you have something to say? Yeah, well, uh, what can I add to what's already been said? That was already perfect. Um, mm -hmm. But obviously, European and especially global media space is vast. And in my opinion, combating Russian propaganda and misinformation is as much as a matter of states' politics and standards and like unified action as it is about personal information hygiene and um, um, hence choose what you follow wisely, <laughs> choose who you follow wisely. And um, rubrica is a wise choice. I can assure you of that as a person who's actually doing rubrica. So yeah, that, that's um, that's what I, what I can say on the previous question, giving uh, Kaimo some time to... Um, yeah get acquainted with the question in the comment section <laughs> yeah 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 uh we have two questions uh, in the chat uh, uh that uh, have been submitted just recently um oh even three okay so let me read the uh, first two questions aloud uh, so estonian intelligence believes that russia is preparing uh, for a confrontation with the west Evidently, Estonia is in the zone of increased risk. How prepared is Estonia for this? Is the West fully aware of this danger? So, 
Ambassador Kusk, uh, I believe uh, it, it should be addressed to you. Good. I will. Uh, so uh, we have uh, understood that Russia is a threat for us already uh, from the beginning of the 90s when we got our independence back. Uh, although we have said, our former prime minister let's say the, uh, in the 90s, he said that uh, oh, we have the best relations with Russia ever because we are not occupied. Uh, no, uh, we understand uh, very well uh, what the threat is. Uh, threat perception inside uh, EU or NATO are of course different. Uh, for example, Belgium uh, don't take Russian threat as existential. We, Estonia, definitely take it as existential. How uh, prepared we are? Well, better than yesterday, better than a year ago. Uh, first of all, we are NATO. And this uh, war with Russia will uh, be completely different uh, what Russian aggression looks like at the moment. Uh, pity that we have not given Ukraine uh, uh, enough things and uh, the best things, but they are coming. I have recalled this uh, current year, for example, uh, year 20 F-16, not 2024, but 20 F-16 year. So, uh, so uh, we, are, we are preparing uh, in case of, for example, one example, shelters. Marina can uh, uh, add, I think, uh, what he, she has seen in uh, Finland. They have built shelters on the buildings, schools, things. Also, uh, during the zeros, uh, year 2003, for example, uh, when uh, everybody thought that, uh, well, we can develop relations with uh, Russia. Finland continued to build shelters. We lack them. We don't have metro in Tallinn. In Kiev, you have metro at least. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, we uh, count on NATO. Absolutely. Uh, okay, we have two questions left. Uh, I believe uh, that uh, in, uh, after these two, we are done. Uh, so the the first question is uh, uh, about pro-Russian people. And, and Russians, actually. So the question is, when will all Russians be deported from EU countries? Otherwise, the threat of a full-scale war can become possible. I understand it's uh, in some way uh, a controversial kind of question, uh, and, um, um, and probably we will start with uh, Ambassador Legis, uh, this time, and also uh, we have just a, a very short, but I believe also a very substantial question about Russian opposition in EU. Is it friend or foe? So um, I believe uh, we will just um, address these two questions and we will wrap it up. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. I think they're slightly linked, the two questions. Uh, I mean, I, uh, the European Union is uh, uh, based on rule of law, and uh, because of that, uh, uh, in some ways, people criticise uh, that we're too weak. Uh, but I think uh, we have to stick to the issues of rule of law. So there cannot be any sort of uh, mass deportations of Russians uh, from EU countries. Uh, they. Uh, have to be looked at on individual cases, whether they're a threat to the security of the country, uh, uh, things like that. So uh, we, of course, because we inherited uh, a substantial uh, non-Latvian uh, population at the end of the at the fall of the Soviet Union, uh, where you know Moscow had uh, 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 sent. Uh, uh, people from different republics, uh, from Russia, also from Ukraine, Belarus, to Latvia. Uh, so, uh, whereas Latvians were about uh, 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 s s uh, s 70% of the population in 1939, by uh, uh, 1990, uh, we were almost a minority, just over 50%. So, obviously, this question of Integrating 
non Latvians into society has been high on the agenda during the last 30 years. It has been very successful, uh, and uh, we have welcomed many Russians who are loyal citizens of Latvia. Uh, there are some Russians who are extremists. Uh, we have a member of the European Parliament uh, from Latvia who has been uh, elected to the European Parliament at every election since 2004, and she has been identified as being under the payroll of Moscow and as an agent for Moscow, and she uh, will be dealt with according to the rule of law within the country. Um, Russian opposition in the EU, EU is also an important issue. Latvia has become a hub for media outlets. Uh, you know, we have Medusa, we have BBC, uh, Deutsche Welte, a lot of uh, companies, uh, media companies moving out of Moscow and becoming based in, uh, in Riga. And we're very uh, proud to do that. The foreign ministry welcomed them. We have, of course, had to look very closely also at the security elements. You know, the, uh, the intelligence services had to give their approval to allow these people to stay on a permanent basis. We did have one incident where uh, uh, a journalist from Rain TV uh, made some comments that were uh, in favour of supporting Russian soldiers in Ukraine. Uh, we closed that station down as a result of that. Uh, they went through the appeal processes within within Latvia so they could continue to operate from Riga. They eventually moved to the Netherlands. So these are delicate issues, but they have to be looked at uh, in the context of rule of law and uh, from the, very much from the security uh, uh, and threat aspect within the states. Ambassador Kusk, uh, let me ask uh, about your final contribution to Russians in the EU and the Russian opposition issue. Uh, I think uh, if uh, they represent uh, imperialistic uh, view, then it's obvious uh, out. Uh, and that's a very simple question. Uh, whom uh, belongs uh, Crimea? Lithuanian border guards are using it. Everybody who answering uh, wrongly are banned from entry. Uh, so it's it's so simple question. Uh, Russian opposition, if they are fighting against empire and if they are helping Ukraine, I think we can see them as allies. Don't ask you Ukrainians to become friend with them. I can totally understand that. I, I spent four years in Ukraine uh, last year and a half uh, on the full-scale war. I was in Kiev, uh, air alarms, uh, missiles, air defense is working. I take it also very personally because those damn Russians, they shoot Kiev while I was there. Very personally. So I can totally understand you. No one asks you to be or become friends with them uh, again. But uh, they might be allies, particularly the ones who are fighting against evil empire and helping Ukraine. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, we understand that this conversation uh, is uh, long and uh, complicated and... Uh, uh, we obviously have some other questions to our speakers, but I'm afraid we are just running out of time tonight. But uh, let me say that we'll be hosting these kinds of events next month in particular uh, as well. So uh, stay with us and uh, we will be happy to, uh, to welcome you on our events. And let me say uh, great... Uh, appreciation uh, to our incredible speakers uh, we had uh, today with us Kai Makusk uh, is, uh, a former Estonian ambassador to Ukraine and Estonian ambassador to Lithuania we had also Marina Smahina who is a senior editor at Rubrika and a PhD candidate at the University of Helsinki and we also had the privilege to have uh, Iman Slegis uh, former Latvian ambassador to France and former L Latvian defense minister Thank you very much uh, to
to you and uh, to those who joined us online in this this late hour in Ukraine. Uh, so stay with us, read Rubrica in English and support Ukraine. We are really working uh, toward a clear and precise goal to make Ukraine win this hard but important war. Slava Ukraini. Thank you. Hello, Ukraine. Slava. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys.